All right, so generally this is how we're going to proceed um, every session, right? I'll put up the guide questions for next time. As you're coming into the room, copy them down. That way, you know, by the time you get them, you know, you can, you won't be completely exhausted with what we've been doing all morning. Um, then I will give you some background on whatever theoretical method we're discussing. I'll give you a chance to ask questions about anything I've just said and about the essay that we've read. And remember, right, I am expecting people to show up with at least some questions or comments. So please, let's not make this all, you know, one way, me relaying information to you. Um, and then we'll try a little bit of application, right? So in fact, I may as well just pass this around now. Um, we're going to try at the end of class to um, apply Schwabsky's methods to a short story by Jamaica Kincaid, right? Okay, so. When we talk about formalism generally, we're talking about theoretical approaches that are primarily concerned with, unsurprisingly, literary form. Right? A formalist is primarily concerned with specific features or literary devices in the work itself. Right, formalists don't usually care all that much about anything outside of the poem. They're not concerned about the author's biography or psychology. They're not concerned about how the poem relates to historical, about how the text relates to historical events. They're not even really all that concerned generally with how much work or what kind of work the author put into creating the text, right? They are only concerned with the text itself. And part of this is a kind of effort that begins in Russia in the early 20th century to try to make literary criticism a little bit more scientific, right? To try to end its reliance on other disciplines and to reduce the amount of squishiness in it, right? No more feeling feelings, right? Let's break down these objects and try to figure out for ourselves what they are. So if we had to place, so given just the sort of general broad overview of what formalism is and what a formalist does, and having read the Shklovsky essay, right, remember we talked about those four categories of criticism uh, last time. Right? We have the mimetic, pragmatic, expressive, and objective. And somebody just quickly remind me what the aims of each of these different categories is, what they're concerned with. Mimetic is work in the world. Yes, good. Pragmatic is um, the way the work affects an audience. Good. Expressive is work in the author. Yes. And objective is only with work, only the work itself. Only with work itself. Good. Now, if I keep asking you to review something like that in class, what does that probably mean? Going to be on the exam. <laughs> so keep thinking about this, keep reinforcing this, right? Um, now, where would you place a formalist technique in this set? Yeah, pretty clearly objective, right? Pretty clearly only concerned with the features of the work itself and how those features relate to each other. Not concerned with how the work affects an audience, with how it imitates the world, or with how it sort of demonstrates features of the author's mind, right? So to talk about Russian formalism a little bit more specifically, right, because there are different formalisms. And if you can't read my handwriting, just let me know. I know that it's Chicken scratch. Okay, so 
1915, in Moscow, a group of linguists and literary scholars form an association that they call Opoyaz. Now, Opoyaz is a Russian acronym, um, and I don't speak Russian, and I am betting that none of you do either. So translated into English, what this acronym stands for is Society for the Study of Poetic Language. And they have two express aims from the beginning, right? First is a rejection of what they see as the moralism of academic criticism in their own era, right? The relationship, they reject the relationship between literature and morality or ethics. And secondly, they reject outright the historicism of other critics, that the, uh, particularly of Marx, like conventional Marxist critics writing at the time, who argued that there was a direct relationship between culture the production of culture, and the inevitable march of history towards socialism, right? So these guys are saying, no, no, none of, you know, none of this, right? If we're gonna, what we're gonna study is literature, then we need to study the object itself and not these other things to which we think it might be related. So once again, the idea is to try to make it more scientific and to make the study of literature a worthy object in and of itself, right? That's the big idea. The other big assumption that they're making is that literature is a matter of craft. Anything not related to craft, anything not artificial, right? Anything not made by the creator of the text is outside the realm of literary criticism. Now, <clears throat> these guys have a pretty good run in Russia for about 15 years. Then in 1930, One, uh, Joseph Stalin consolidates his power within the Soviet Union and begins suppressing the work of dissident intellectuals. Right? The, the original Soviet regime was largely content to let these people be. Stalin's regime was not. And so, intellectuals who didn't toe the party line were either forced to recant, and several of the Opoyaz guys, including Viktor Shklovsky, did, or they fled the country. And so those who fled the country first settled in Prague, and formed a subgroup with some Czech linguists that they called the Prague Linguistic Circle. And this was how these ideas got outside of Russia. Right? These dissident Russian intellectuals who fled to Prague got jobs at universities there and started teaching their theories outside of Russia. Now, when things then got too hot, in what was then Czechoslovakia, many of these guys emigrated either to Paris, 
where they influenced the structuralists and deconstructionists of the 50s and 60s, or to the United States. So, for a small group of people studying a relatively arcane subject in what in 1915 was basically a cultural backwater, um, this group of thinkers has had an amazing amount of influence, which is one of the reasons why we start with them. Um, in part because historically they're early, and in part because looking at Russian formalism now will help us understand structuralism and deconstruction and various kinds of post-structuralism later on. Right? A lot of these movements build on each other or are reactions to each other, just as the Opoyaz group was a reaction to critical tendencies in the prior century that they didn't care for, right? that they thought were misplaced. Okay, so key figures in this group. Right, in addition to Shklovsky, who we read for today, would be people like, um, in the original group, uh, Boris Eichenbaum, Roman Jakobsen, uh, Yeah, those would be the, and Shklovsky would be the original group, right? Now, the Prague Circle was founded by Jakobsen when he fled to Czechoslovakia and included younger thinkers like the Czech linguist Jan Bukharovsky. Velek was um, the guy who was the biggest promoter of Russian formalist ideas in the United States later on. Okay, so this is the context they're coming out of, right? So let's talk a little bit about what they actually believed and what they actually did, right? What the method actually looks like. All right, so the basic assumption underlying all of their work is that there is a distinction between practical language and literary language. Right, practical language is everyday mundane language use. Its primary purpose is to communicate information, right? I'm using it right now. Right? What we're doing right here in this class is using practical language. And it operates by making references to the non-linguistic world. Right, practical language always has some object other than language itself. Right, so if I tell you, for example, to sit at your desk, right? Then I am making ref I am making direct reference to things that are not language, right? Two objects, you and desk, right? Now, literary language, on the other hand, is a mode of experience rather than of communication. Literary language does not communicate information and does not try to refer to objects in the non-linguistic world as clearly and concisely as possible. Right? What literary language does 
is emphasize, for lack of a better word, its literariness, right? Its language that draws attention to itself as language, as a non-standard use of language, with no clear or obvious referent, right? So by literariness, what they mean is the qualities and internal relations of linguistic signs. Now, this is one of the reasons why formalism tends to work best when you're studying something like a poem. Because a poem relies on devices that are not common in standard communication, right? Rhyme, stanza form, right? A specific and repetitive meter, alliteration, right? Repeated sound patterns and repeated patterns of imagery that have little to do with actually getting a specific message across to you. So that's the kind of thing that the formalists are referring to when they talk about literariness, right? Is everybody following so far? Is anything fuzzy or unclear? Everybody get me thus far? Yeah, Jeremy. Well, we say motorists. Yeah. Us, um, Lang literary languages, but instead of just communicating information, like you say, it's supposed to uh, <coughs> be an experience. It leads uh -huh. us, it's uh, the, I don't know if we're going to get to this yet, but like seeing something for the first time and describing it, not, not um, recognizing it and trying uh -huh. to uh, communicate that and it being an experience in that so. Yeah, the idea is to try to describe a thing to you in a way that's unfamiliar, right? In a way that is not conventional, because practical language is the language of habit. It tends to, uh, Shklovsky, for example, would argue that practical language tends to deaden us to sensations in the world around us, right? We just get so used to the everyday world, we get so used to things um, that our responses to them become habitual. And so what literary language does is it helps you to see the world around you in a new way through a process called defamiliarization, right? This is a big one to remember, right? This is a key Russian form formalist term, right? Defamiliarization. So uh, the example Shklovsky gives um, is a short story by Leo Tolstoy, um, which is narrated by a horse. And he quotes a lengthy passage in which the horse tries to, um, tries to puzzle out why people keep referring to things as my or mine when they never actually use or enjoy them, right? So what he's trying to do is make us look at the idea of private property in a new way by talking about it in a way that we're unaccustomed to through the eyes of a narrator who simply wouldn't see property the way a human being does, right? The horse just sees this as this kind of ridiculous and inexplicable thing that human beings do, right? They insist on owning things that they never use or enjoy. Um, so that's how defamiliarization works. The idea of defamiliarization is to reawaken you to sensation, to make you remember what it felt like to see something for the first time. Okay, does, that, uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. All right, any other questions? Is that part of why, or it, maybe it's not connected at all, but he ends that little passage with saying that the horse died before he could finish the story, or <clears throat> yeah, the horse Yeah, the horse is killed okay, yeah, the before story. the story ends, um, and is then buried along with its last owner. Um, but uh, yeah, um, he yeah he continues in that same mode of narrative, like he, like the idea of the funeral, 
right, where you're disposing of these objects that are now lifeless and useless uh, is made to look ridiculous, right? By breaking it down to all its component parts. Like, I think the way Shklovsky argues Tolstoy does defamiliarization is by not calling the thing by its usual name, but by breaking it down into all of its component parts, describing each of those parts in turn with great specificity, so that you kind of have to assemble for yourself what it is he's talking about, right? It's like, oh, he's describing a flogging. Oh, he's describing a funeral, right? Example is of a theatrical performance, right? War and Peace, right? And you know, yeah, it, it's yeah. And yet, you know, when you break, you know, when you just break down what people are doing on stage in a play and how the audience, like, it looks weird, right? Right. Right. It seems odd. But yeah, that's that's defamiliarization at work, right? And you know, Shklovsky and his cohorts would argue that that's not just something that Tolstoy does, it's something that all authors do to, you know, vary, to varying degrees. Okay, so we've already talked about the way a formalist critic foregrounds language and the literariness of language in order to defamiliarize the subject, right? That's the big goal, that's the big aim. There are a couple more wrinkles to this that it's important to understand. So one of the things that defamiliarization does, or is supposed to do, is get people to rethink dominant social codes and social values, right? When you present the values of the culture you live in, in this kind of unfamiliar way, it can get you thinking, like, like for example, the, uh, the funeral scene that Shklovsky describes, right? It's like, wait, so we take the body of someone who is no longer alive, right? We take a corpse, we dress it up in its best clothes, we stick it in a box, we seal that box with lead, and then we send this maggot-ridden thing by train off to be buried somewhere far away, right? Like, what, why the fuck do we do that, right? What's the point of that? And this is what made the formalists seem dangerous or dissident to the Stalinist regime, right? This idea that you can use Lydia, that defamiliarization challenges dominant social values. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I want you to please think. <laughs> please be thinking. Um, I'm saying as far as the government. Well, <laughs> okay. Let's see. So what? What else? Um, right. What else is important here? Okay. So two more things to talk about here. One, it's pretty easy, as I said, to apply this to poetry because poetry by its very nature, defamiliarizes language, right? It's often a little harder to apply this directly, especially to lengthy prose, but they do try to do it, right? So here's how they deal with prose fiction. By making a distinction between story and plot. So a story for a formalist is a sequence of events that follow each other in time. Right. 
this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Plot refers to the artful arrangement of events. to achieve defamiliarization. So you're not just following the strict plot line, right? From event to event to event to event. Uh, so to give you an example of how this would work, right? So how many of you have read um, uh, say, uh, The Sound of the Fury? Any of you familiar with The Sound of the Fury? Okay, that's at least a couple of you, right? So. What's the first check? What, what's the difficulty with beginning to read The Sound of the Fury? Benji is. Yeah. Um, has some sort of a disability or. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's divided, up, it's divided up into four sections, right? And Benji, the narrator of the first section, is autistic. So he is not. So he is unable to describe the world to you in the way you would normally understand events, right? So he's un unable to describe events to you in a way that makes sense to someone other than him. So you kind of have to puzzle through much of what he is saying. Now, Benji is also speaking in the story's present, right? When we go back to his brother Quentin's narrative, right? Quentin is dead at the time Benji is speaking. So Quentin's narrative takes place in the past. We then return to the present with his other brother Jason's narrative, which is much more clear cut, but also filtered uh, through Jason's selfishness and racism. And then we finally have a fourth chapter by an outside narrator. Um, which leads us out of the story, right? But by giving us narrators whom we cannot fully trust or believe, um, and who in some, in some cases can't even really tell us what's, what's happening to them, and by moving around in time, the story, the sequence of events, is defamiliarized as we have to piece it together for ourselves in order to figure out like what happened to the Compson family. Right, uh, similar, uh, uh, similar sort of situation with a novel like, uh, oh, how many of you read Wuthering Heights? Or at least heard the wacky Kate Bush song with the, 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 the soaring you know, vocals about Heathcliff and shit like that. <laughs> it's been a while, but okay. I enjoyed Wuthering Heights. Okay. okay, good. So, I couldn't tell you too many details about it because it's been a long time, but, but I, did, I remember liking it. <laughs> but like in the presence of Wuthering Heights, right, at the time the story is taking place, right, Heathcliff reigns in the house and our primary narrator has moved into the little nearby cottage on the grounds, right? And he gets the whole story of the house and its inhabitants from this old nurse who has been working in the house for a long time, right? Now, is also not a very pleasant human being. But, but everything we learn about him, we also get through, the, through the, the mouth of this old woman who hates him, right? So we can't, we can't really say we necessarily get a fair assessment of his character because everything we know about him comes from somebody with an ax to grind. In addition, right, we have the past of the story being narrated within the present of the story, right? So we have that order of events, again, being artfully split up. These are the kinds of things that a formalist pays attention to, right? These are the kinds of things a formalist is concerned with. Um, now, uh, last thing, before we just start talking about Shklovsky in a little bit more detail, um, is that 
while they while they don't do historicism, right? Formalists are not concerned with how works of literature are shaped by or relate to historical events. They do actually have a theory of literary history. But it's based primarily on looking at genres. So this is how formalist literary history works. Basically, right, in any era, there is a dominant genre. Right, one big genre that most people work in. And within that genre, there's going to be a hierarchy. So for example, in 18th century England, poetry is the dominant genre. And certain kinds of poetry are more valued than others, right? A philosophical poem, is greater than a satirical poem, which is greater than an elegy. Now what starts to happen as one genre achieves dominance and new writers are drawn to work in that genre is that the genre becomes a set of conventions, a formula, right? Right, the genre hardens into a formula. And for a formalist, once something hardens into a formula or a set of conventions or habits, is it still literary? According to Slavsky, it would mm -hmm. not because it's generalized. You become too familiar with it. Right. So not desensitized to it. Yeah, you become desensitized to it. It's no longer unfamiliar, right? So it just becomes practical language. It's no longer literary language. And so it then is supplanted by another more vital genre, right? That's still doing something new and weird. Um, and a formalist would argue that changes in genre dominance are unpredictable. And the dominant genre in one historical period doesn't necessarily have anything at all to do with the dominant genre in the previous period or in the period that succeeds it. Right? There's no necessary causal relationship between the three. These, this, right, shit just happens. <laughs> Right. The primary, right, the primary qualification that it's different. Uh, yeah, it happens with most art in general, especially with music. Mm -hmm. um, when a little, you know, another maybe some genre comes out that becomes specific and maybe take over that genre. Especially like from what I see that now is like between rap and country music, like from where it started to where uh -huh. it is now. You know, it's, uh -huh. it's completely. Well, and, and then there's that weird fusion of the two. As well, like, like country rap is a thing that I still find just bemusing. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I guess like part of, part of that is because like I, I grew up in a place where neither country nor rap was particularly popular. I mean, like, like you know, I'm you know I grew up in northern Pennsylvania in the '90s, and so like the dominant genre in popular music when I was growing up was you know lumbering Sasquatch rock from the Pacific Northwest, right? You know, guys in flannels and big heavy boots with long hair, um, you know, wielding guitar as phallus, right? Yeah. Um, now that itself had supplanted a 
genre of LA pop metal, right? With guys with big teased out hair wearing a lot of makeup, um, singing the songs about partying, right? That was then replaced by other guys with long hair wearing work clothes, singing songs about being sad. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm not sure how directly we can relate this to formless. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting exercise. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all art. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, these are the basic sort of assumptions a formalist makes, right? And we can draw a lot of this kind of directly even from Shklovsky's short essay, right? Now, the, um, do any of you have any questions about Shklovsky specifically? Yeah, Ramon. When he mentioned parallelism, okay. I got a little confused on that. Okay, take us to the passage. Oh, it's towards the end. Page 12. Second paragraph. Okay. So such constructions as the pestle and the mortar, or old Nick in the infernal regions, are also examples of the technique of defamiliarization. And in my article on plot construction, I write about defamiliarization and psychological parallelism. Here then, I repeat the perception of disharmony in a harmonious context is important in parallelism. The purpose of parallelism, like the general purpose of imagery, is to transfer the usual perception of an object into the sphere, sphere of new perception. That is, to make a unique semantic modification. So what he's talking about here is like, when you draw an analogy, what you really kind of ought to be doing is drawing an analogy between two things that are not obviously alike. Right, so um, how many of you are familiar at all with, uh, with, metaphy with what metaphysical poetry is? Like John Donne, um, uh, yeah. <coughs> the tick, right? Pardon? Uh, the, the flea, flea. Not, flea. not the flea. tick. <laughs> the tick. Very close. The, tick, the tick was a comic book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, a metaphysical poem works according to what's called a metaphysical conceit, right? Where you take two things that are not obviously alike and you point out a surprising similarity, right? So, for example, the flea, the poem that you referenced, um, compares a flea to sex, right? Because it takes fluids from both of the individuals, right? And the speaker in the poem is trying to convince his mistress to sleep with him, and says, "Well, this flea has already bitten both of us, right? So, in a way, we've already done it. So, you know, what's holding you back?" So, yeah. Um, Essentially, what Shklovsky is arguing, is arguing for that is a good kind of defamiliarization technique, right? That when you're drawing analogies, when you're drawing parallels between two things, try to choose two things that are not obviously alike, so you can demonstrate a surprising similarity. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions you guys have about this? Well, the term is reach. I heard you say that, right? When you take two uh, points that are really hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Together. Okay, yeah. Well, what's right? it's, it's a reach or a stretch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. that was pretty good, though. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, two things that I want to note here from the Shklovsky essay that we didn't quite get to in the general overview of formalism, right? First, if you look on page, uh, bottom of page 11, right, after he's given us all of his examples from Tolstoy, right. Now, having explained the nature of this technique, let us try to determine the approximate limits of this application. I personally feel that defamiliarization is found, excuse me, almost everywhere form is found. An image is not a permanent referent for those mutable complexities of life which are revealed through it, its purpose is not to make us perceive meaning, but to create a special perception of the object. 
It creates a vision of the object instead of serving as a means for knowing it. So, what <clears throat> we can boil this down to, right, is that language, as Shklovsky sees it, shapes the way we perceive the world, perceive an object, but not what the object itself is. Right? So basically you're saying he's looking for the descriptors and not the actual thing. Well, that the descriptors don't bear any necessary relationship to the actual thing. All they do is shape the way we perceive the thing. So if we use the conventional descriptor for the thing all the time, then we're going to perceive the thing in the usual concept, uh, conventional way. Take away that online feature. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't. Language doesn't change the nature of the thing right. at all, right? It's Ever. It. it just changes the way you see it. Yeah. It just changes the way you see the object. He wrote that, um, that Shklovsky wrote that the deconstructs the familiar mm -hmm. to that of the unfamiliar by writing in such a manner that the object changes from without changing the nature. Yeah. Which is Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. A horse is still a horse. Right. No matter how it's been. Yeah. But if yeah, if we describe that horse as, you know, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> quadruped with a mane and a tail that eats hay, right? We don't perceive that object in quite the same way. Right? Well yeah, exactly. Yeah, we still have to we have to kind of piece together what is it like. Um, you know, a good example of this kind of defamiliarization technique, have any of you ever read Gulliver's Travels? Or have, are any of you familiar with the portion of Gulliver's Travels where he talks about the Yahoos? And what you have, yeah. And what you have to slowly piece together as you read that whole chapter is like, like shit. He's talking about people, right? The Yahoos are human beings. They're not these ape-like creatures. Well, they are ape-like creatures that wear no clothes and you know, squat and shit on the ground and all that. Right? Mm -hmm. They're constantly fighting with each other and flinging poo in each other's faces. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but they are physically, by and large, indistinguishable from human beings. But he describes them in such a way as to make that unclear. So you have your so your brain has to do that work of being like, oh, I'm a Yahoo, right? We're all Yahoos. Um, the last thing in the Shklovsky essay that I just want to point you to. All right, if we look at the bottom of page 12, top of page 13, right, the basic point of this passage is that the nature of literary language and ordinary language is never fixed. They can only be defined in relation to each other. Right, so what is ordinary language in one historical period might become literary language in another if we no longer use those same conventional descriptors in our everyday speech, right? So, Ordinary speech, practical language, literary language, can only be defined in opposition to each other. You only know one if you know what the other is. And they're not always going to be the same. All right, does this make sense to everybody, more or less? Everybody good? Okay, so what I want you to do is have a look at that Jamaica Kincaid story that I gave you. You know, it's it's you know about overall about a page and a half long, right? And what I want you to do is first off, right, piece together the basic situation. Right? What's actually happening? Secondly, I want you to pay attention to 
to various means of defamiliarization. In the story, right? How is the basic situation defamiliarized? And how are things within, like how are other things within the story also defamiliarized, right? Just look for all examples of defamiliarization you can find. And go. You might also want to think about this in terms of story and plot, right? What's the sequence of events here and how is it arranged?
Take another few minutes, keep at it, make sure you're not missing anything, okay? I know it's short. So has everybody made it through it at least once? Okay, so let's start from this distinction here between story and plot, right? Now, if we were to write this out as a story that is just a sequence of events, what would we have here? Um, I'm just, oh, sorry. I'm not sure if I personally would call it a plot, per se. It's a... <laughs> How do I describe this? It's a, but it's very sequential. Okay, yeah, I think I, yeah. I think I'm pronouncing that word there, right. Yeah, and, and, and there's, there's a theme yeah. of what I can assume is the girl's mother telling her all these proper ways to be a woman or something like okay, that. Okay, and that's basically, in terms of story, that's all we've got, right? There's one event. It's a conversation between a mother and a daughter. Mostly one-sided, right? Except for two lines. Yeah. The two lines and the talents are the daughter, yeah. So in terms of story, yeah, this is just a conversation between a mother and a daughter. So how is this artfully arranged then to make it more interesting, right? If we're just told a mother and a daughter are having a conversation. Big fucking deal, right? Who cares? Why should I be interested? So what is Kincaid doing to defamiliarize the situation for us? Whoever? Oh, uh, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say most mothers don't talk to their daughters like that. Oh, yeah, there's there's some problematic content in there. In this thing, uh, I guess. Oh, okay. it, it's uh, more of like a one-to-one -one to the horse thing you were saying earlier, where mm -hmm. it's telling you what it's like. Because it says she's from the West Indies, so it's yeah. like for an American audience, see what that's like. Uh, so okay. it's like she's has the mom like telling the girl what to. So it's really a story about what it's like being a girl over there, but it's through the uh -huh. eyes of a very over overbearing mother. Okay, yeah. And yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. I was going to say, it's, it seems like it's done in a way of a, a to do list rather uh -huh. than um, an actual conversation. It's just like, you got to mm -hmm. do like this. It, it, she provides the structure. Uh huh. Um, 
that, that's as far as that. I like the other, the, the, okay, it's written like, like a to-do list, right? Yeah. But then, do we have here any conventional markers to tell us who's talking and when? Okay. Um, not really. Uh -huh. um, you, until the italics, you can kind of gather who might be talking, and then yeah. the italics thing in happens, and then it's like, oh, and then it, and then it kind of tells you, okay, so it's mm -hmm. mother and daughter. Yeah. So if we want to talk about this in terms of plot, right, then what we're talking, like, the way this is defamiliarized generally, right, is that it's presented to, like, we're just sort of made into observers of the conversation, right, without any of those conventional signposts of conversation in a novel or in a short story, right? There are no dialogue markers, there are no quotation marks, there's no, my mother said, and then I said, right? Very few periods. Very few periods, yeah. Um, the sentences sort of pile on top of each other, the clauses pile on top of each other, and as, yeah, as Jeremy said, sometimes it reads like a to-do list, right? And each thing to do builds on the last thing you were told to do, or revises in some way the last thing you were told to do. Or not to do. Or not to do. <laughs> I think for, for us as the reader outside, there's things without context, but for them, if they were having a con conversation, yeah. they know what context mm -hmm. is, and we just and move from them. And that's part of the point here, too, right? Is that, remember, like where this, the story first appeared, as you see in the little note, in The New Yorker in 1978, right? So it's not written for a West Indian audience that would know what Dasheen is, or that Ochre Trees attract ants. Um, or what the hell Bennett is, right? There are a couple of things that we need footnotes to explain, but yeah, the original story would not have come with footnotes, right? The, 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 in its original publication, those weren't there. Those are there for the benefit of the student. Yeah, Jerry, if I'm walking by and overhearing the conversation, and yeah. that's, that's how I would, I would sense, like walking by and having no kind. You hear it, yeah. So, and you know, I can understand words, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, in context, it's like, okay, that's, I it that's actually an interesting point or two. Is there any visual description in the story? Just about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like we we have no idea what either of these characters look like, right? We have no idea what the setting that they're in looks like, right? We we can imagine there are you know. We can, you know, sort of, if we know anything about, you know, about Antigua or about the West Indies, there are a couple of things we can make guesses about. But yeah, we're given really no other indication as to where they are, right, their relative status. Um, you know, we don't know anything about these people except the conversation they're having and the language That's they're not using. That's necessarily true, at least from my reading of it. Okay. Especially from the clothes washing aspect, because uh -huh. if you have money, you're not going to put your clothes on a stone or hang them on a clothesline. Uh -huh. So therefore, that tells me that they're of median means uh -huh. or lesser. Okay. So, the, so there are a, yeah, there are a couple of potential class markers right. there, right? But otherwise, it's hard to get any concrete information about these people, except for the mother-daughter relationship, right? Also yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. No servants. Yeah. I, I'm, and this is just me. Maybe we're assuming that they're having the conversation, and this is not in the girl's head. And those parts were that I talked Those um, were moments where she chimed in with her mother. But this could all be just the girl in her head doing the checklist. Well, with the yeah, the the mother. Yeah, the mother. Was, that, that's that's true. Like we we don't we don't necessarily know that this is an actual physical conversation taking place, that it's not the girl remembering her mother's advice and thinking, th you know, thinking back at certain points, right? But the mother does always, or the mother voice, right, always does respond to the italicized question, right? Except for the, I never sing on Sunday school. She just kind of ignores it. Yeah. yeah. Which I like. Yeah, right, you don't. Yeah, yeah I like that because <laughs> sure it's like, know. Yeah, yeah, she <laughs> just kind of doesn't listen to it. Right after it, there's a few more sentences mm -hmm. before she responds, which would indicate to me that the mother's like ranting and mm -hmm. the daughter doesn't have time to respond 
Mm -hmm. Then this thought crosses her mind, you know, I don't even sing the song, let alone in Sunday school. Mm -hmm. Now, if they had a close relationship, the mother would already know this. She wouldn't have to, you know, keep telling her not to do this. Okay, but yeah, um, let's not, um, let's try not to get too deeply into the, <laughs> the details of the mother-daughter relationship, right, and focus more on the language and the defamiliarization process, right? That's what a formalist would do. Yeah, Caleb. One thing I thought that was interesting, I guess I kind of want to ask you about, uh, talking about like, the defamiliarization, um, mm -hmm. is connecting words to ideas like uh, singing, you know, which I never thought, you know, you never really connect that to being a slut, but the mom does. Yeah. Brad says, uh, the, mom, the mother connects lots of things to being a slut, right? Yeah. And I think that that's actually one of the things that's interesting about the story is the way it demonstrates the slipperiness of language and how the things that we use language to refer to are often kind of arbitrary and slippery, right? So what do you think the mother actually means when she uses the word slut? Does she seem to use it to refer to the same thing consistently? It's not necessarily even anything sexual, right? It, it, it almost feels like she's just saying it to, um, using it at, to refer to a woman, to any woman in that culture who's not proper or anything like mm -hmm. that, if that makes any sense. Okay, so you think it, it's more a status thing than a behavior thing? Mm -hmm. that's, that's my two cents. Okay. I wanted, um, I wanted to ask, this kind of went up in my head, but I thought it was it was interesting the way it says uh, on the lower part of 253, uh, this is how to make a good medicine to throw away a child before it becomes a child. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, well, I just realized what that meant. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, again, yeah, right, but that's, that's, that's defamiliarization yeah. at work, right? Yeah, you, don't you don't name like the, you, like yeah, you don't name the thing. You describe the thing in a, in a different way, and then it takes you a minute to piece together what she's talking about. Yeah, that's actually that's a perfect example of a defamiliarization technique. Yeah, Bradley. Um, I kind of like that to rebel or like someone who doesn't want to follow. Okay. Because. That it's not even so much a class or status thing; it's somebody who won't follow the rules. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, right. A she does show a little bit of defiance, kind of, because her mom's like domineering, and uh -huh. she squeezes these little bits and pieces in there. Uh huh. Kind of like the but, stuff. But mom always gets the last word, right? Yeah, go ahead. And um, I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if it'll add too much to the whole, the whole thing, but it's. I find it interesting that um. After, Despite all, despite all these t talks of not being a slut, mm -hmm. later on she talks about this is how you bully a man and this is how you love a man and, uh -huh. and there's other ways. So I can only assume that, yeah. yeah, no, it's not actually talking about being promiscuous. I don't know if that adds a whole mm -hmm. lot to the discussion or not. That is more than that. Yeah, well, and I, I, I think that it's probably more fair to say that the mother doesn't mean the same thing consistently all the time when she uses this word, but she just uses this word for everything she thinks is bad. For everything that she thinks indicates rebellious behavior or um, behavior outside the norm, right? So even this word is kind of defamiliarized a little bit for us in that we have to puzzle out through context what the mother even means when she says this, right? Because she does, you know, because the way she uses it seems often seems hypocritical or contradictory, right? So you know, maybe maybe the problem is not so much that mom's a hypocrite as that mom doesn't mean by this word what we mean by this word, right? Oh, that must have been a very awkward conversation with the mom teaching her daughter how to have sex. That must have been. Very awkward. Just wow. throwing that out there. I'm just glad I don't have kids. <laughs> Same. Don't have to have these conversations with a dog. <laughs> All right. So um, I think we're about at time here. Um, so we'll let it go there.
Uh, we're going to continue along similar lines with Clamp Brooks next time. Uh, Brooks is not a Russian formalist, but a lot of his ideas are similar. So this will not be totally new and unfamiliar territory for you. Um, all right. So um, James and Caleb, um, I'll need you guys to uh, just come upstairs and get a couple of handouts from last time. But.